Welcome to the third segment in our session on the inflammatory myopathies. In the previous segment, we discussed the first of three inflammatory myopathies we'll be covering in this session, polymyositis, which results from CD8-mediated inflammation of the endothelial lining. In this session, we will look at a second condition, which has a very different histological presentation pattern, as well as a dermatological component, as the name implies. In this session, we'll be looking at the presentation pattern, pathophysiology, treatment, and prognosis for the inflammatory myopathy referred to as dermatomyositis. Again, dermatomyositis is a relatively rare condition, but will affect about 1 in 100,000 individuals, a little more than what is typically seen with polymyositis. As with polymyositis, dermatomyositis tends to be more prevalent in the black population and in females compared to males. It is most common in individuals in the 45 to 60 year age range, which helps to distinguish it from limb girdle muscular dystrophy. A principal difference between dermatomyositis and polymyositis is their pathophysiologies. With polymyositis, we observe a CD8 T cell mediated attack on antigens within the endothelium. Dermatomyositis results from a complement-mediated humoral attack against the endothelial lining of arterioles and capillaries supplying muscle tissue. The disease is likely initiated when antibodies target the myovascular beds, forming C3B and C4B fragments that lead to formation of a membrane attack complex, which are deposited in the vasculature. As the disease progresses, the capillaries are destroyed and microinfarction occurs. In the early phases of the disease, the majority of tissue damage is limited to the paramecial lining surrounding fascicles. As the disease progresses, the inflammatory response penetrates deeper into the fascicles through the endothelial lining. B cells and CD4 helper T cells are also abundant in the inflamed tissue. This is another important distinction between dermatomyositis and polymyositis. Analysis of biopsy samples from patients with polymyositis demonstrate CD8 cytotoxic T cells, which initiate the inflammatory response. With dermatomyositis, there is most commonly the presence of CD4 helper T cells within the inflammate. With respect to musculature, Patient presentation pattern is essentially the same as that for polymyositis, with limb girdle weakness and lack of facial muscle involvement. What distinguishes the two diseases is the skin presentation that is unique to dermatomyositis. The pathogenesis of the cutaneous component of dermatomyositis is poorly understood, but is thought to be similar to that of muscle involvement. The most common cutaneous issues involve a heliotroph rash, a term to describe the purplish hue that the rash typically takes on. The rash is most prevalent in the skin exposed areas, suggesting that sunlight may aggravate the condition. The prominence of this rash around the eyes and cheeks is sometimes described as a raccoon mask because of its appearance. Another common skin manifestation are gautron papules, which describes a thickening and redness of skin over the knuckles and other joints of the body which may or may not include nodules. While the presence of these characteristic dermatological findings, along with the muscular findings, can assist with the diagnosis, it is complicated by the fact that the two patterns may not necessarily present together. Either muscle weakness or dermatological findings may present first, and sometimes precede the other by months or even years. In the instances where weakness appears first, it may be mistaken for polymyositis. Histological analysis will assist with reaching the correct diagnosis. When they appear together, the combination of muscle and skin manifestations provide clues to the presence of dermatomyositis. When muscle symptoms are present, blood tests will show the presence of creatine kinase and aldolase. This will generally lead to electromyography or MRI tests to identify affected muscles and potential biopsy sites. Histopathological analysis will show inflammatory mediated damage in the paramecium surrounding arterioles and capillary beds. Analysis of these infiltrates will demonstrate complement intermediates combined with CD4 helper cells, lymphocytes, and macrophages. 
Evidence of regenerating muscle fibers is typically greatest along the periphery of the fascicles, closest to the regions of infiltration. This finding is not always observed, but when present, it helps to differentiate the disease from polymyositis, which affects fibers deeper within the fascicle. Necrotic ghost fibers will also be evident within these histological samples. Treatment for dermatomyositis is essentially the same as was described for polymyositis. The patient will be prescribed a high dose of corticosteroids to control tissue damage, with the dosage being cut back to a regulatory dosage that prevents recurrence while minimizing adverse side effects. That concludes this segment on dermatomyositis. In the next segment, we will look at the third and most distinct type of inflammatory myopathy, inclusion body myositis.